How's it going? I'm Mr. Berger and welcome back to Art 101. I want to get into the artwork of one of the contemporary giants that's out there when it comes to nature and overall contemporary work and a little bit of abstraction. Uh, truly a giant in the way of real creative power and her name is Georgia O'Keeffe. From Midwestern roots all the way to becoming one of the most influential artists in history, uh, I really want to examine her background, so let's get after that. I like it. Now if you're anything like me, when I think of the millions of paintings out there that revolve around flowers and nature, there's no other artist in contemporary context that come to my mind before Georgia O'Keeffe. Hailing from a dairy farm outside of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, which is just northeast of Madison. If you happen to be traveling through Wisconsin in June, you could travel down the Georgia O'Keeffe Memorial Highway into Sun Prairie and visit the Georgia O'Keeffe Celebration, which is held in the beginning of June. It is a fact that her high school years would greatly impact her professional career. Her high school art teacher brought in a jack-in-the-pulpit flower for the class to draw. The typical high schooler of that time would have drawn plaster casts, photographs, or copies of famous artworks. But this flower drawing sparked an enthusiasm in her that would not fade. From a very early age, she wanted to be a painter, she wanted to be an artist. And she pursued that goal all the way to attending the Art Institute in Chicago. She would also study at the Art Students League in New York and Columbia University Teachers College. All of this training was done for her to become an art teacher. She would have a very brief teaching career, teaching in the states of Texas, Virginia, and South Carolina. Her last teaching post was in the state of Texas. In 1915, her last year of teaching, things would drastically change for her in a professional sort of way. She would drastically change how she would approach all of her art making. Just like anything new, a new style, a new approach, a new way of looking at things can take some time. It can take some time to get used to that and to figure out how you want to look at it and approach it and, and view it and interact with it. You know, it, 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 this could be a, a, a lot more uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know? Begin with charcoal, and I wasn't going to use any color until I couldn't do what I wanted to do with charcoal or black paint, and went on from there. Although she was changing her way of work, this would have very little impact on her climb to success. That occurred after sending a couple of these charcoal drawings to one of her very dear friends. Anita Pulitzer received several of these drawings back in 1916, and she recognized that the gallery of Alfred Stieglitz was the best place for these works to be promoted. So she took the little portfolio down to him to take a look at them, and after a few months he had them hanging up in his gallery, called the 291, located on 5th Avenue in New York City. And that brings us to another point. You really can't get too far into Georgia O'Keeffe without looking at Alfred Stieglitz. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Stieglitz was the father of modern photography. Early in the 1900s, he was developing an avant-garde style of photography that he called photo secession. He made a name for himself taking photographs of real life, people, and situations. He was married in 1893 and would have a daughter, but eventually that would fail. In the meantime, he would try to develop photography as an art form. Is that all you think about? Photography? At 291 Fifth Avenue in New York City, he would start an art gallery on the top floor, where he would promote the top artists of the day as well as photographers that were working to get a name for themselves. These are artworks that you could literally see nowhere else. He would introduce New York to a whole range of artists that they had never seen before, and eventually in 1916 he would do the exact same thing through Miss Pulitzer with George O'Keefe. At that time, George O'Keefe was still working as an art teacher in Texas. She would eventually allow him to hang her paintings and drawings up for sale in his gallery, 
and the two became pen pals, corresponding for quite some time. At the end of the school year, Stieglitz would offer her one year. One year of free rent, a place to hang her work and sell, and a private apartment for her to live in. It was an outstanding opportunity and she jumped at it. Within a month of moving to New York, Stieglitz had left his wife and moved in with Georgia. He would use her not only as a way to fill his studio, but also as a muse to take photographs of. He would create over 300 photographs of her. There were several shows where her artwork was hung next to his photographs of her, and she did not like the attention that the photography gave her. The famous psychiatrist Sigmund Freud had views that were very widely appreciated at that time, and many of these things were not quite so positive about her sexuality. By the 1920s, everyone was searching for the great American thing. And that was at the time that the men were all talking about the great American novel, the great American play, the great American, oh, it was the great American everything. And I thought they didn't know anything about America. A lot of them had never been across the Hudson. So I thought, I'll make my picture a red, white, and blue. <laughs> I'll make it an American painting for these people that don't go across the Hudson. And this was my painting. I put a red stripe down each side. Entertained me, but I don't think anybody else caught on to it for quite a while. I had no idea. There was definitely a conception which was largely based on misconception about her artwork and what it meant and what it was about. I always say I've had everything said about me that they could say except that I've died. Here on Art 101, I like to take you on location to be able to see things firsthand. Now I know, what do I know? I color for a living, but take a look at these clips. So we're out here at the Museum of Fine Art in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, there's lots of great things here inside, lots of uh, diverse things, but there's one thing in particular that I really want you to see. If you can make it out to St. Petersburg, Florida, there's lots of really, really great art out here, and this museum has two Georgia O'Keeffe's. One is called Gray Hills Painted Red, New Mexico, from 1930, but I really want to focus my attention on the other one. Now, to give a little background information, in the mid-1920s, George O'Keefe was living in New York and painting lots of really hard-edged buildings and things that were around her. But it was also around this time that she would start to produce these very, very large natural forms, including those flowers that she's very well known for. This painting called Poppy from 1927 is a prime example of that. She's enlarging this flower into a huge scale so everybody has to pay attention and notice it. She painted poppies at least seven times. Women are oftentimes associated with being flowers and this is that calling back to the critics and the people that called her out for her sexuality. There are many of her other paintings that have much more of a direct connection with the female anatomy. My art has been commended as being strongly vaginal, which bothers some men. The word itself makes some men uncomfortable. Vagina. What in the hell? That is the inside of a womb. A woman's womb. My boy is not going to look at the inside of a womb. He's only been out of yours for 11 years. I'm here in Des Moines, Iowa at the Des Moines Art Center where we're going to take a look at a Giorgio O'Keeffe painting. I love visiting the Des Moines Art Center. It's a very great modern art showcase, but it also has a lot of historical pieces. From the Lake, number one is an abstraction of her time at Lake George. She would spend a lot of time there with Alfred Stieglitz's family. It was an oasis away from New York at Lake George, and she loved spending her time out there. This particular painting is a bit of a rare abstraction for what she was doing in the 1920s. But the point of me showing this particular painting is that upon inspection, you can see how unperfect some of her line work is. You can see how jagged some of the lines are. When one inspects O'Keeffe's work from a distance, it looks perfect. It looks so sharp and crisp. But when you get really, really close to it, it's not quite as sharp as you might think. And the moral of that story is, as an artist, Sometimes we have to know, okay, this is what I want. This is the tone that I want. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. 
as artists, we can't bully ourselves and beat ourselves down because something isn't absolutely perfect. Sometimes the perfection comes from taking a step back and observing from a distance like a normal viewer would see the work. To jump back just a little bit to the idea of George O'Keefe creating the Great American Painting, from 1929 moving forward, New Mexico becomes Georgia O'Keeffe's America. She walks away from the skyscrapers and into natural beauty. Several of her friends were going there on a regular basis and she followed suit. By this time, she was married to Alfred Stieglitz, who would not go due to health reasons, but they would meet up at Lake George and vacation together nearly every year. After the closing of his gallery, Stieglitz needed some help. He got that from fellow photographers Paul Strand and fellow photographer Dorothy Norman. She was a mentor and eventually became a lover with Alfred Stieglitz. Coincidentally, Georgia was also not without her flaws and extramarital situations, but we'll just leave that right there. At any rate, Strand and Norman helped Stieglitz secure a new gallery that he called an American place. While Alfred was getting his gallery up and running, Georgia would return to New Mexico. While out in the desert, it was very scarce to find flowers, so living in Ghost Ranch, she resorted to painting more bones and skulls and things of that sort than flowers. She also loved to look and paint the mountain range that was out there that she painted multiple times. Her environment very much had a contributing factor to the work that she was producing. Upon falling in love with New Mexico, she would spend most of her time on that 21,000 acre ranch called Ghost Ranch. It was a very hard place to live and a tough life, so she would relocate to a four acre plot that sits atop a mesa. With advanced age and some illness, she was forced to move into the town. It was there that she passed away in 1986 at the age of 98. Another kind of art historical uh, sub-conversation is that Georgia O'Keeffe was not the only artist in her family. According to legend, Georgia O'Keeffe's younger sister, Ida, was considered by the family to be the more superior artist. Ida reportedly felt that she would have gotten the same fame had she had the push in New York from someone like Alfred Stieglitz. She would support herself as a nurse and teacher and there are some 70 known paintings by her available in the art market. In 2018, there was a published book of all of the known works done by Ida O'Keefe. That's a great article from Smithsonian Magazine. Beyond the visual arts, Georgia also left behind a legacy as a fighter and someone who stood up for their convictions. She was always a strong believer in and an advocate for women's rights and gender equality. She went right after the gallery owners that felt that women that didn't have a place in the gallery. There's a lesson that we can learn from Georgia O'Keeffe. Take something of beauty, something small, something that you pass by. The drive to work is only as boring as you allow it to be. There's beauty everywhere. Your life is only as horrible as you allow it to be. I think if you approach things with a different flavor, a different outlook, a different perspective, you can choose to change the course of everything. Today is New Year's. Every day is New Year's. You can choose to be a no good son of a gun today, or you can choose to be Mr. Rogers. That's up to you. Hey, thanks for coming on into the art studio today and joining me, Mr. Berger, with another episode of Art 101 and this episode on Georgia O'Keeffe. Hopefully you found it informative and enlightening and your passion for art is only enhanced by what we've had to discuss today. And we'll see you next time. Make sure you click the bells and ring the buzzers and, and do all the things you got to do to subscribe so you can stay in tune. I usually put out uh, videos periodically and you'll get those updates by uh, following those uh, bells and whistles that you click on to be able to follow along here on YouTube. Until next time, see ya.